And I'm joined by the one and only, Mr. Chris Slade. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, glad to hear it, man. Um, obviously, um, when we air this interview, uh, you know, the new uh, new album from uh, Chris Slade's timeline will be out on the 19th, uh, this coming Friday. But before yep. we talk about the album itself, how did the timeline project come to be? Because you've been together, is it 10 years now you guys have been together? Yeah, it's more like 12, actually, now. Um, it came about because I wanted to play my timeline. <laughs> I wanted to play my career. Um, and I knew I had to find people that were able and willing to go from ACDC to, uh, say, Tom Jones or Mantra Man's Earth Band or Uriah Heep. You know, and uh, I knew these guys. I've, I'd known them before, um, just as people, I mean. And I went to see their band um, doing covers in a pub. And I was bowled over by them. I thought they were amazing because they were doing covers like Genesis yeah. and Kansas both vocally and musically, and it was perfect. And so I knew that these were the guys, if they wanted to do it, that uh, they could do Timeline. My idea, I didn't have the name yet, Timeline, but it was to play my career. And they were up for it. And uh, it's been, we've been together now for 12 years. Nice. So, uh, you know, and uh, James and, uh, Mike, who are the key, the guitarist, James Cornford, and the keyboard player, Mike uh, Clark, they've been playing together since they were 11 years old. Oh, and right. they're, th they're 35 now. So, you know, uh, they're a tight unit. Absolutely. And they know where each of them is going. So it's quite exciting on stage. Um, and the bass player is uh, Stevie G, um, bass player and singer, uh, because he's the singer that does the Manfred Mann uh, Earth Band and uh, Raya Heap and well, that's the not firm, easy locally. The firm things like that. Yeah, he's a he's a really good singer, yeah. and the ACDC singer is uh, exclusively ACDC is Bun Davis, and. Uh, he does a great job. Yeah, it really does. Uh, as you can hear on the second, but he also sings with his ordinary voice <laughs> on the, a couple of tracks on the originals side, which is uh, Sundance and Back with the Vengeance. So, uh, you know, he's, it's, a, it's a very exciting band live. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a really exciting album, Chris. Like you say, I mean, before. Oh, thank you. I've been fortunate enough to hear it, um, and we'll get on to the cover side of thing of the disc too in a moment. But you mentioned Sundance there; that's a great opener. I really, really enjoyed that. But how were the songs on this album? Were these songs that you yourself had around for a little while in some form, or was this more of a collaborative uh, thing with the rest? No, of it, the um, it's uh, the originals came together. I started two and a half years ago. Okay, I started been able to write melodies. I've never been able to write melodies before. I've written lyrics all my life. Yeah. Um, and mainly for Earth Band, but for, you know, for my own amusement, if you like. So I've always done, uh, I, I love working with words. So, um, you know, I, I didn't know I could write a melody. And then one day, two and a half years ago, one popped out. It just came out like that. I went, oh, da, da. and I said to Mike, uh, "Can you make some sense out of that, Mike?" <laughs> I don't, I don't play a musical. I don't play a chordal instrument. No. So I could hum, uh, and I could always sing in tune. So I could sing the lines, but I couldn't put any chords around them. So Mike did that, and he did a fantastic job as far as I'm concerned. Um, but the melody lines themselves, so I realized that it wasn't just melody lines, 
it was bass lines, it was string lines, nice. it was uh, harmony parts, vocal harmony, like three or four of them, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and the guys are really good at interpreting, as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but yeah, so, uh, you got, they you got... made, uh, you know, they made it sound great as far as I'm concerned. And thank you for con confirming that. Thank you. No, no problem um, at all. Like I say, I've, it's uh, when I got sent the album, I think it was last week I got sent it. So, you know, I was getting living a, a good few spins now. And I was talking to yourself. You mentioned Sundance. Living the Dream was another track that I really enjoyed. Where did that come from in, in terms of songwriting? Again, it just popped in yeah. to my head. And I put it down on a, a recorder and uh, went round to Mike's because he doesn't live far away. Nice. And, um, you know, I said, uh, make sense of that. And he did. I had a lot of parts already written on that. Okay. And to me, it's it's about, uh, you know, it's called living the dream. But you can't live the dream. First must come self-belief. Right. So the whole crux of the song is believe in yourself right, you know and that's what must you must do if you're a musician or anything if you want to be a dentist you got to believe in yourself you're a terrible dentist you hurt everybody you know <laughs> <laughs> oh well perhaps I'd, perhaps I'd become a doctor instead <laughs> uh, but you know it's uh it, it, it's i just you know, to live the dream, you must have the ability and the self-belief first. Uh, because without that, because somebody's going to say, you are just terrible. You are, well, no matter what you do, you are terrible. When you, look, just give up. You're not <laughs> even as good as me in my head. You know? Because <laughs> that's what it is. They live in their heads, these troll people. Oh, yeah. It's always and, the people uh, who have actually actioned anything. Yeah. I, I, you know, I played in Carnegie Hall in my head. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm good enough to, I know I am. Yeah, man. Yeah. Practice first, man. Practice. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> which is what any musician has done. You practice. Yeah. And uh, that's how you get to Carnegie Hall. Um, and it, you must have that self belief because somebody's going along saying, oh, you're practicing wrong. Oh, <laughs> don't practice that. That's, that's ridiculous. Practice like this, yeah. You know. Oh, so you know you're a you're a saxophone player? Uh, <laughs> oh no, no. I'd always like to play saxophone, but uh, <laughs> I, I play good in my head. But um, you know, uh, no, I've never been in a band. Oh well, <laughs> I, I see where you're coming from, man. Uh, <laughs> thanks anyway. Bye. <laughs> um, and you got to be able to do that. You got to have rhino hide when you're a musician. Um, you just must. Yeah. Um, nobody will like you in the beginning. Nobody. Uh, you'll be the worst player around. Oh, he's not playing soccer because, uh, oh, oh, he's practicing his flute, yeah. you know. And you've got to go, ah, I don't want to play soccer. I want to play my flute. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and just self-belief. That's what it is. Love that. Um, at any age. Because people are going to go, whoa, it's, it's not as good as X. Yeah. And you go, well, I'm not X. Yeah. So I can't make it like X. I'm sorry. If you like X, I'm glad you buy X's record. But, um, you know, I can't be X. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, but I can only be who I am. Absolutely. And I like that sentiment in that one, mate. Um, you, you sort of mentioned, there, obviously, that you got the, the second disc there with all the covers on it. What, or like obviously songs that you've been involved in throughout your career, they're not straight covers, obviously they're songs from your career, songs that you're involved in the writing of, or songs that, you know, you've, you've utilised in terms of some of the ACDC tracks that you've got on there. But what made you choose the songs that you had on specifically on those, on that disc? Because obviously- you've uh, I thought they were the best ones that we had in the can. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to do a good job. We recorded them live. So they are live, but they, they are going through a desk. Oh, okay, a proper yeah. recording desk. So uh, we just did the best job that we could do. Um, 
and it uh, they turned out not half bad actually the way I see it. I love the the, the rendition you've done of Blinded by the Light on there. That sounds great. Oh, great! Thank you. Um, that we do that live, of course. All those songs we do live, um, and we'll do some uh, original very soon live um because live is what we are we're a live band really yeah Did um, you cut the first disc live on the floor so to speak then as well yeah yeah um so we'll do all the all the ones we can do off that um off the first disc the second disc is pretty much part of our set we do two hours every night half of it is uh, acdc and half of it is um you know, and that's to I do that to give the singers uh, equal time, if you like, on yeah. stage. Um, because uh, you know, Bun does AC, as I said, Bun does ACDC, and Stevie G does the other stuff and plays bass. So they both do a fantastic job. Um, and you know, we will continue to do that. Uh, Last weekend, I was in Lyon, France. Yeah. Two weeks' time, we go to Italy for a weekend. Um, then we go to Germany. And we've uh, three months ago, we were in Poland. Nice. Um, this year, I don't know what month, we were in uh, Chechnya. Oh, wow. And all points east. And we go everywhere in our van. We drive everywhere. Uh, we rarely fly. We have flown. We flew to like Sicily and places like that. But you use rental equipment and it's it's not great. And I'd like to use my rock or bust drum kit also with the two <laughs> flying kicks up here, flying bass drums up yeah. here. Um, and you can't do that if you rent stuff. No, no. So um, that's why we just the main reason we drive. I'm not afraid to fly, but all the security in the airport really puts me off, and I'm sure it puts everybody off. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. But um, so we we drive absolutely everywhere, and we have been driving absolutely everywhere for 10, 12 years. So apart from COVID, you know. Yeah, of course. Um, so and I just love being in a van, going somewhere. Um, but speaking about your career and everything, mate, one album I did want to ask you about because I'm a huge Gary Newman fan. So I wanted to ask you about the I Assassin album and and how that came to to be working with that. Ah, um, yeah, uh, he was recording it uh, at a studio that a recording studio that I co-owned back then. Oh, okay called Rock City. And uh, he want, he needed a different drummer. And he asked me, because I was always there, you know. And uh, he asked me, and I said, yeah, of course, Gary. And he asked me if I knew any fretless bass players. So... Uh, oh, was you know, it you who brought Pino Palladino into the mix? That's how Pino got in. Oh. That's, okay. how P that's how Pino became a bass player. Yeah. Fine bass. Be before that, he was a guitarist. Before he was Pino Palladino, he was Jimmy Page. <laughs> he used to play a double neck Gibson, you know? Oh, I didn't but know that. I knew he was a great bass player. Hmm. Um, we have a mutual friend in John Snowman, who was the lead singer in Uri Heap when I was in the band. And he introduced me to Pino, you know, and he said, this guy's great on Fretless. You want to hear him? And John is still a good friend, and uh, he's he knows his stuff, you know, mm -hmm. musically. And uh, and he and Pino went to school together because Pino oh. is Welsh. He's not Italian. His father was Italian or yeah. is Italian, probably. And uh, he was Giuseppe, Giuseppe Palladino. And 
he and Pino was Giuseppe Pino Palladino, which ah, means okay. little little Giuseppe. So his name is Pino Palladino. Um, and that was his first time he'd ever played fretless bass on record, certainly. And the bass um, on that album were incredible. It's like, you know, music for chameleons and all that is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I knew he was up for it. Peter is such a musical player, you know. Uh, it's tremendous, tremendous musical imagination. Oh, nice one. I mean, you, you played with, you know, so many amazing people, but I was watching an interview uh, with yourself, quite a recent one, actually, where you discussed obviously getting, uh, you know, two incredible offers in just a few hours between uh, David Gilmour and uh, and Jimmy Page yeah. the same day. <laughs> It was one and a half, two hours between the two of them Amazing. on the same day. <laughs> um, you know, Gilmore phoned and it was like, I didn't I didn't think it was him. <laughs> um, uh, but I'd met him. So after I heard him talk for a few, for a little few seconds, uh, I realized it was David Gilmore. And he said, uh, I'm putting the band together and I'd like you to play drums. I went, oh, thank you very much. Uh, but Dave, you know that um, I'm in a band with Mick Ralphs of Bad Company. Yeah. And uh, he said, oh, that's okay. Mick's doing it too. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, came, we became the Gilmore band for his About Face tour. Right, right, right. Um, and we toured with him for a year on a bus, a full year. And it was a tremendous experience. He, he's such a great guy, Dave, really is. What you see is what you get. You see him in an interview, that's how he is. He's not putting an act on or anything like that. That's how he is. And he's a tremendously generous person oh. with his time and his money. Um, he had a house in London. He sold it for about two or three million. And gave it all to the homeless. It's amazing, isn't it? Not many so people. you know, uh, he's he's a really good guy. Um, and then hour and a half, I went down the pub after we arranged, you know, to get on the road together. So I said to my missus, "Let's go down the pub." Went down the pub, came back hour and a half later for lunch, of course. <laughs> of course. And uh, half and half later, I get back to the apartment. Ring, 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 ring. Pick up the phone. Oh, that was Jimmy Page. Yeah? Uh, and I thought, Fred, come on, I know it's you. No, 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 no. It really is Jimmy Page. Uh, uh, and I thought, oh, right. Oh, it's nice to hear from you, Jim. <laughs> um, <laughs> what else are you going to say? Get off the line, man. Stop bothering me. <laughs> um, um, and, you know, me and Paul Rogers are thinking of putting a band together and we'd like you to play drums. Well, I can't believe this. Thank you very much, Jim. But, you know, not two hours ago, David Gilmore called and I'm going on the road with him for three months. I thought, honestly, is the best policy. Yeah. Dead silence, dead silence. And I thought, oh, that's it. You know, of course it would be normally. Yeah. And he went, that's okay, we'll wait. Wow. And I was like, what? I took the phone away from my head and looked at the phone. I went, what? Oh, it doesn't compute. <laughs> um, well, yeah, okay. Um, how long are you going to have? For three months. Well, let me know what you're doing and where you are and all that. And uh, we'll do it when you come back. Okay, so um, they ended up, him and Paul ended up waiting for nine, ten months for me to come oh. back off the road because the Gilmore tour got so successful that um, it just kept getting extended and extended. It was finally about ten months, and uh, they had waited, which I was just... It's amazing, that it was, especially the pressure they must have been on the, to, you know, to come out with the firm stuff. Well, you know, they... they they wouldn't deal with, you know, they'd just go and look, we'll do it when we do it, okay? Yeah. It's Jimmy Page, for God's sake. It's Paul Richard. Rogers, you know? Um, we'll do what we want, guys. Um, 
So we finally got together as the firm and then Tony Franklin came along and that was, you know, again, was an added thing. Tony was fantastic. He's a trained pianist and he could sing and he played fretless just beautifully. And, you know, that was how the, the firm was born. I mean, those two albums, the, the debut especially, made a huge impact. And, you know, there's still albums that I know me and my friends talk about, you know, that, that particular debut especially. Have you ever, has there ever been any talk of getting the firm back together at any point? Yeah, we were going to get back together. At oh, okay. Point. And um, uh, this uh, unknown band, uh, they were called, what they called, Led something. Led, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> oh, Led Zeppelin got back together, yeah. Um, so that put the mockers on it. So we we didn't actually ever get the firm back together, yeah. which is a great shame because yeah. it was a really good band, and we had a great time. What can I say? Well, that's all that matters. Though, is that you had a good time and you know, great some great music at the end of the day. Was what to yes, be. I would like to add another one. I would have liked one more at least, but wasn't to be. Yeah, but, but we were together two three years. Um, that's longer than a lot of bands get together and stay together. So, uh, you know, what can you do? You can just be philosophical about it. That's all. That's true. But, you know, another, another sort of act, um, I'm a huge Aerosmith fan as well. And I re remember reading somewhere that at one point you and Rick, De Rick DeFay were talking about getting a band together. Did that oh, Rick DeFay, yes. Uh, yeah, he became a friend, but I haven't seen him for years now. He moved to L.A. and uh, gave up the music business almost completely, I think. Um, yeah, I was going to do a band with him, mm. and I made, a, I made an album with him also. Oh, okay. And um, then uh, I was out with Gary Moore yeah. for a year. Uh, was it 88, 89, somewhere around there? And uh, I got the chance, they're the same management as uh, ACDC. Gary Moore was the same manager, a guy called Stuart Young. No um, no uh, relation to Angus and Malcolm, um, although his name was Young. Um, and I got the chance to audition, which is all you can ask, actually. Yeah. To, uh, you know, audition for the biggest band in the world. Yeah, okay. <laughs> of course. Um, uh, Gilmore would see me play, by the way, with huh? Mick Walsh. So, you know, uh, but Paige would never see me play. It's probably somebody telling him that I was okay for the job. Yeah. Uh, I had met uh, Paul Rogers before when he was in Free. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, we did a tour of Australia, Deep Purple, Top of the Bill, um, Earth Band, and then opening the show was free. Wow. That's can, you believe, that. can you believe that? <laughs> um, and Paul was in that band then. Uh, so I'd known him since 71. So we weren't strangers. No. Um, but uh, that's what, so I auditioned for ACDC and, um, uh, you know, it was, uh, I didn't think I'd done very well at all. No? And uh, it was just, um, you know, I thought I did really badly, actually. And I kept kicking myself saying, why did you say that? Why did you play that? Why didn't you play that? And I was so distracted that uh, I lost my way home. I, it was an hour away from the rehearsal place. Oh, wow. An hour. And I got lost. Uh, it was just north of Brighton. Oh, okay. In England, UK. Yeah. And um, I lived in one hour away and I couldn't find my way because <laughs> I was so distracted um, by myself. And so I thought, I better call my missus, let her know I'm going to be later than I said. Yeah. So I called and, uh, you know, she said, how'd you do? How'd you do? I said, ah, not good. Wasn't good at all. Um, I'll tell you all about when I get back. 
So I got home. She came up the path. I got out the car. She said, so you did badly, do you? I said, yeah, I uh, wasn't good. She said, they just called to say you got the job. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> they had called me before I got home. Um, because, of course, no mobile phones in those days. Yeah. Just uh, house phone rings. Um, Bet your missus couldn't wait uh, to wind you up, could she? Say again? Bet your missus couldn't wait to wind you up, could she? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, let's go down to the pub. <laughs> so we did. Absolutely. <laughs> again, nobody else called after that. It's funny, uh -huh. that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my uh, my brother Danny called. Yes, I remember. No, no. <laughs> I mean, the, the you know, the live at Donington ACDC footage, you know, has become really iconic. And, you know, it's one of those things that I think everyone's watched at some point. But when you were when you were playing that show, I know it was Monsters of Rock and it was headlining set. But when you were playing that, did that feel like that was going to go down? Did it feel like an extra special event while you were playing that? Donington itself? Yeah. Uh, no, it, 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 it felt re like recording mm. uh, a live band that I was in. And uh, which it was. Yeah. Um, I didn't think, oh, this is going to be something. Even even recording Thunderstruck, I didn't think, oh, you know, uh, that's uh, that's going to be iconic. That track, which it is, of course. Yeah. Um, um, I did know when Blinded by the Light. Sorry, wrong. I did know when it's not usual was recorded with Tom Jones. We oh. all. Because we, uh, we the Squires, which is uh, backing. Tom Jones' backing group, uh, we knew, and Tom, we knew that was a number one record. Um, and we went to the pub across Channing Cross Road because we recorded it in Regent Sound in Denmark Street. Oh, yeah. And uh, we went across the road, across Tottenham Court Road to the pub, went in there. At a, at a point, and Tom said to the manager, "If I can't have that song, because Gordon said no, it's recorded. It's we demo it for somebody else." I was going to say, yeah. I think I saw an interview with Tom saying that he was record. They record you'd recorded a demo, but it was meant for someone else. It was meant for Sandy Shaw. That was it. Who was a big singer at the time, and Sandy said, "You know." This isn't a song for me. This, this this is a song for the guy who's singing it. She had no idea who Tom was, of course, because he wasn't famous yet no. uh, in any way. And that's what she said. Apparently, was no. This isn't my song. This is this guy's song. And that's how Tom got it. He said, "If uh, if I don't get that song, Gordon, to Gordon Mills, mm. I'm going back to Wales and I'm packing in." Wow. He was like uh, 25. He'd been told when he was 23, she was that self-relief again. He'd been told when he was 23 that he was too old to make it now. Crazy, isn't it? 23 years old. Because Herman's Hermits was uh, fast coming up the charts, you know? Oh. And uh, Tom was not Herman's Hermits. He was like 23. And they were like, so probably teenagers or 20, something like that. 23. You're no good, Tom Jones. You're washed up, man. You're too old now. He's 88 now and he's still singing. <laughs> <laughs> he's still gigging. He's still doing it. He's still putting out good chains. Yes. And his voice, he's lost his top end now. You know, he was a tenor. Now he's a baritone. Yeah. But nevertheless, what a tremendous voice. Absolutely. The... I always say the the greatest untrained voice ever born, and I, I'm sure that's true because he's never had a singing lesson in his life. Um, he had one, uh, but he lasted about twenty minutes and left because <laughs> he couldn't he couldn't take uh, you know all the bullshit that goes with it, so to yeah. speak. So, how did you end up playing for Tom Jones in the first place? I was like. You say you were playing um, back in there, but how did that My happen? father knew him because he was a tap dancer and singer. Oh, okay. And he used, to, he used to work in a concert party, as they were called back then, uh, entertaining the miners and sea workers in the conservative clubs and the labour clubs up and down 
the Ron the Valley where we lived. Yeah. And um although I hadn't met Tom and didn't know Tom, my father used to come home all the time and say, Oh, that uh Tommy guy was with us um you know uh, tonight and yeah. uh He's better than Tommy Steele. And I said, he can't be, Dad. He can't be. Otherwise, he'd be on the telly. You know, <laughs> that was my logic. I was about uh, 14, I expect. And, uh, of course, that guy turned out to be Tom Jones. And my father was right. Yeah. And my, my brother went to school with him, but I'd never met him. Um. So I knew where he lived. And uh, the youth employment people had told me in school that I could make a great career in shoes and I should go to a shoe shop to work. So it was a bit like um, Spinal Tap, you know, I'm sorry, <laughs> sir, we, we don't have that, we don't have that size. <laughs> um, and uh, I did that for a while and the, one of the assistants, this is uh, deja vu for you or whatever. Um, one of the assistants in the shop used to go and see Tommy Scott and the senators every Thursday night at the Green Fly in Carfilly. And uh, she came back one night and said, hey, Chris, Chris, they sacked their drummer last night. Yeah. You're a drummer, aren't you? Uh, you should... I said, they're not going to want me. I'm 16. They're in 16 their 20s. When you started drumming for Tom Jones? Say again. You were 16 when you started drumming for Tom Jones? Yes. Wow. Um, so they, I thought, they're not going to talk to me, you know, not even talk to me. My brother wouldn't talk to me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I finally plucked up the courage and went up to him and said, um, blurted it out. Uh, you sacked a drummer last night. You need a drummer. I'm a drummer. I live by Tom Jones. No, I live by Tom, which I did. I lived about half a mile probably from Tom, although I'd never met him yet. So uh, it got arranged, long story short, because there were no mobile phones in the 60s, you know. And... Uh, we there are only phone boxes at the end of the street, which everybody used. You know, put your penny in, and you can get through for a couple of minutes. So somehow we arranged uh, for the guys for the band to come to my house where I had my drums set up, brand new Premier kit. Nice, um, brand new, not second hand. I'd already done the second hand stages of drums, and I paid for them myself. Wow. And they were, in my, they were in my front room, Zildjian cymbals and Premier drums. And uh, I got the money because I was a delivery boy. Oh, okay. Uh, so that's how I made some money to pay for it. And um, I came to the house and my audition consisted of, uh, can you play the intro to Walk, Don't Run? which was the Ventures' big hit back then, instrumental. So I rattled that off, just the intro, not the song. And uh, they said, OK, let's go to the pardon rehearse. <laughs> so they each grabbed a drum, no cases, just the drum. And uh, we walked to the bus stop about half a mile, got on the bus to Pont Preeth, got another bus to Abercannon, um, and... That was a rehearsal place. On the way there, Tom said to me, I remember, very clear, he, he came up to me and we were standing in the aisle, both of us, and he said, we're rehearsing in a pub. How old are you? I said, I'm 60, I'm 17 in a couple of months. All right. He said, can you drink? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a terrible thing for a 16, 17 year old to say, but it was true. And it was a different world back then. Yeah. Because everybody drunk, at least beer, you know, or cider or something. Um, and it was endemic, I'm afraid. And it was uh, a terrible thing. I wouldn't like my kids to go, and thank God they haven't gone that way at all. Um, so 
you know, in fact, none of them do drink. They've probably seen me and thought, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a good lesson for, uh, for my kids. That's, that's so good. I'm, I'm very, I'm very nice to them. I, I never go home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, they live all over the world now. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the terrible thing is, I've got to go visit them. <laughs> you know, one lives in Canada, one lives in Seattle. You oh, know, they're all over the place. And my youngest lives uh, around London, so I'm very pleased about that. Yeah. Um. So uh, you know, and they both drummers. Both my sons are drummers. Oh, okay, didn't know that. I warned, I did warn them, and they're good drummers too. I must say that. I, you know, I couldn't think any other way, but they actually are good players. Um, and I, I warned them, I said, don't be a drummer, whatever you do, put your energy into learning keyboards or guitar or singing or something. Just don't be a drummer, you know, because the pecking order <laughs> for drummers is just terrible, you know. Top of the list comes lead singer, lead guitarist, lead bass player. <laughs> no such thing as a lead drummer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they even, bands even forget to tell the drummer. You can ask many bands, you probably have. Forget to tell the drummer that there's a gig next Wednesday, you know. Yeah. But you didn't tell me. Well, you didn't ask, did you? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's terrible. So I warned them, don't be a drummer. But they both became drummers. So, you know, to be. Terrible thing. <laughs> so when you were growing up, Chris, you know, we we mentioned Buddy Rich earlier, but who were the people that made you want to pick up the sticks and get behind a kit? How did you come Buddy, to get Buddy Rich. Fair play. <laughs> um, because there was nobody else. I mean, there was nothing. Uh, don't forget, this was the 50s. Hmm. There was hardly any music on the radio. It was all uh, workers' playtime sort of stuff, which is right. uh, lunchtime they would have some music for the workers of Britain on the BBC. So they'd have, uh, you know, and they'd have Billy Cotton, big band. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that was our musical upbringing. And, you know, Ringo, it was the same. And Cozy Powell, I keep mentioning them people, but it was the same for them. Um, it was a desert as far as drummers concerned. You could hear guitarists occasionally on the BBC. And I didn't have a TV. I didn't have a TV till I was about uh, 10 or 11. No, it was 11 or 12, actually. Yeah. And because uh, it hadn't been invented yet. So... Uh, <laughs> people, you know, I say that and people believe me. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I didn't have a TV till I was about 11 or 12. And, uh, they, and then in the 60s, I think, Radio Luxembourg came along. And that was where pop music began. Yeah. And uh, they would play the latest hits. And then the Beatles came along and it was like, I was a huge Beatles fan. And uh, I really like Ringo. And I, I still do, by the way, he's playing. Um, but when I started, there was nobody that you could listen to. You could only listen to jazz players. So that's what I did. And it stood, it, uh, stood me in good stead when I joined Tom Jones, because Tom then went into big bands as his backing band. Um, and the Squires were around for a while, but they went by the wayside um, for various reasons. And I stayed with Tom. And he, when we first joined, he wasn't Tom Jones. He was Tommy Scott. Um, and then he became Tom Jones. He took his middle name. And I became Chris Slade. Because I'm Slade, my that's my middle name. Slade is my middle name. The bass player became Vernon Mills instead of Hopkins. Vernon Mills Hopkins. I was Chris Slade Reese, R W S. Um, 
and we all took our middle names on Piccadilly Circus in London. I don't know what the day was, but um, it was about 63 or 4. Okay. But uh, and I've always stuck with that name, and I like it. Uh, in fact, a lot of people call me Slade. They don't call me Chris. <laughs> my my friends and my missus calls me Slade. All right. Um, and I use it as a first name. I don't mind being called Chris at all. Oh, thank God, I've called you at the whole interview. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, <laughs> don't worry at all. I I answer I answer to both. Uh, the band calls me Slade. Yeah. You know? So, so uh, thinking about like obviously timeline stuff, you guys have been going for twelve years now. So when you got the call back to go back to ACDC for the Rock or Bus tour and everything, was that were you guys right in the middle of touring yourselves with Timeline? Yes, I got the call from ACDC. Uh, uh, timeline. I was in Switzerland with Timeline. Oh, okay. And um, the call came in, and uh, the guys are going, hey, uh, you're late, you're late. I'm going, hey, C, D, C. This time it was a mobile phone, you know. <laughs> um, and so those the guys were quite happy for me to do that, even though they had to look around for work, of course. Yeah, yeah. But a couple of music teachers anyway, uh, three of them are music teachers, actually. So... Um, they weren't so perturbed, um, so that at least they could uh, have a job while I was gone. I was gone for two years, mm. um, and they could see the worth of me doing it, of course, and so could I. I wanted to do it. You know, I, I enjoyed it and uh, had a good time on the road. And... Uh, People say, well, you know, would you go back with them? Yes, of course I would. I didn't get the call this time. Oh, last okay. time I did, last time I didn't think I would get the call. People kept saying to me, friends and all sorts of people, have you had the call yet? I said, look, look, guys, they're not going to call, okay? I know they're not going to call. It's been, what, 30 years or something. Yeah. They're not going to call me. Ring, ring, there's a call. Um, so... Uh, this time, I, I really did not expect a call, and I didn't get one. Yeah. Um, I know Matt Log quite well. Yeah. I knew him when I, I used to live in California. Oh, okay. Um, and I knew Matt then, and he was a session guy, and he did Alanis Morissette, Jagged Little Pill. Um, and he didn't want to go on the road with Alanis because he wanted to, uh, he wanted to be a studio musician oh, okay uh, so uh, i should think when when he got the call from acdc he'd learned his lesson by then so he went on the road <laughs> with him you know? and i knew he was a very competent capable player and uh didn't drink angus doesn't drink at all never has in his life people find that very surprising but he's acdc yeah yeah he's never drunk or taking drugs, and neither have I. Actually, I've I've drunk quite a bit, but I've <laughs> never I've never taken drugs of any kind. Neither has Tom Jones. Um, it just so isn't good. in the culture that we were brought up in, you know. Uh, drinking was, but drugs were not. Yeah. So, uh, I don't mind. Uh, I have many friends who use drugs recreationally, you know. So, uh, just not for you. Good luck to him. It's just not me. It's uh, yeah, not um, me either. I'm a, I'm afraid of it. Actually, I'm afraid of them. Shall I say? I hardly ever, until recently, took any pills at all of any kind. If I got a headache, I didn't take aspirin or anything like that. I just wasn't into putting anything into my body that's not supposed to be there. No fair play. So. Uh, that's my philosophy, and that's Tom's philosophy also. Um, you know, when we first went to America, people were lighting up all sorts of things. Yeah, but um, but uh, we never, we never actually took any. So, yeah, fair play. 
That was just us. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, going back to that tour, because obviously when you start the tour, Brian Johnson was obviously still singing. Then he had the problems with his ears and Axl Rose took over. What was that transition like? Because that must have, I mean, it seemed to be quite seamless from an audience's point of view. It was from our position too. I didn't, um, I didn't even know Axel was in. Oh, okay. The next, the next day. I see what I mean by pecking order. They didn't tell me. <laughs> um, so I was like, uh, who's in today then? It's Axel Rose. Axel Rose? What are you thinking? Uh, well, you know, because I'd heard all the horror stories. Yeah. And I shook his hand when he arrived, and uh, I thought, because I can usually tell what people are like when I shake their hand. Normally a good sign, isn't it? And it's just like, I, you know, I'll say we're from this guy, or this guy's all right, you know? And that's how he came across to me. And then he started singing, and he was like, whoa, I had no idea this guy had a voice like that. I, I honestly did not. I was so shocked. Um, because I'd only ever heard him in Guns N' Roses, and it yeah. wasn't this voice, but he's like uh, so many sing good singers who can just change your voice when you think it's necessary. Yeah. Um, and uh, he sang everything great. I, You know, he's not Brian, and Brian is not him. No. Um, but... He did a great job, I think, with um, with doing the ACDC songs. And Angus, Angus must have thought that that was the case because really? he yeah. said they're doing those songs. Um, Axel said uh, when he was back in Guns N' Roses, he said, Were they? and he was never late, by the way, ever. Um, and uh, he said on stage with Guns N' Roses, um, with ACDC, I went to boot camp. Uh, they told me, if you screw up, Axel, you'll get the boot. So, <laughs> so that was his motivating factor. And he had such respect for ACDC and uh, uh, his era, Bon Scott. Yeah. Um, so, of course, I'm sure it bled into Brian era as well. It must oh. have. Um, and he was chuffed to death to um, be in ACDC. So, uh, you know, the people who missed out and sold, resold their tickets or whatever, missed a really great experience. You know, I'm not going there. You know, it's Axel Roses. That yeah. Peter from, you know, was always late in Guns N' Roses. I'm not going there. They're not going to start on time. Always, we started on time. Um, and he used to warm up two hours wow. before a show and one hour afterwards. And uh, I know because I was in the next room to him. Wow. So it's like uh, Axel starts singing, oh, it must be time to go soon because Axel's off. <laughs> <laughs> and I took it very, very seriously indeed. Uh, he had his vocal coach with him on the road. And uh, it was a very nice guy, actually. And, you know, that's, you know, I said he's not Brian. I'm yeah. not comparing like with like here. Um, I'm not saying he was better or worse or that Brian's better or worse. I'm just saying he did a great job. And that's my take on the whole thing. Yeah. And I had no, I had no say in it whatsoever. It seemed like, from a, from an audience point of view, anyway. Although, like you know, like I say it was like seamless, but it seemed like going back to what you were saying. You know, we all knew Axel for being getting Guns and Roses and turning up late and blah blah blah. But it seemed like he really put the work into the, the ACDC stuff. From what we could say, I mean, like you say, he was using a different range in his voice to do it. So he was trying to do the songs justice a bit more. He didn't come out as you know. It didn't feel like Axel and ACDC, you know, him doing covers with you guys. It, it felt like he really tried to integrate himself in as best he's as best as he could in the time. Yeah, I I think he did. I think that's a, a very good uh, take on that. And uh, I there was nobody more surprised than me actually 
And he was, you know, he was always telling jokes and telling stories and things, which you don't think of in Axl Rose, you know. But he always had something funny to say or a joke or a story, something. Yeah, cool. Um, so, you know, as far as I can see, uh, he he was 100%. Nice. Well, go back to, 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 you know, Glade's timeline and all that. Are you planning on doing any UK shows? In uh, I don't know. I think we got one or two um, still. Because um, I'd love to hear these yeah. songs live, basically. I'd love to hear these songs live. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I would love to hear them, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to play them live. It's just picking the time. Yeah, of course. As I say, the next few gigs is Italy and Germany and France. Um, oh, we go to Wales at the end of this year. Can oh, nice. It? Yeah, go back there to Pont Uh the the Mooney, the Municipal Hall, the Mooney, oh. and uh, we go back there, and we have a couple of other gigs too. Um, just one more thing before before I let you go, man. Um, at the beginning of the interview, I'm going to play. Um, I'm going to play Sundance because we spoke about that um, earlier. Yeah. But what song? Uh, what song from the album would you like us to play at the end of the interview? Uh, time flies. Cool. We'll lock that in. Well, Chris, thanks for your time, man. And uh, if you can, if you can manage it, if you have the time, end of eternity, which is straight after time flies. It's you, mate. We'll chuck them all in. Oh, lovely. Yeah, all three because in. Uh, I'm singing on that, and the guys wanted me to do the the lead vocal you know they said you've done the demo because i always demo my things yeah um you've done the demo and it sounds great you should do the the real thing so i did and i am just over the moon the way it turned out oh brilliant well we'll lock we'll lock all three in and uh yeah thanks for your time again man it's been a great great pleasure to talk to you thank you very much indeed uh it's been great it's really been really nice talking to you